There we go. So hi, I'm Zach Bowman. Um, I'm really, really excited for this conversation today. Um, I'm just gonna quickly introduce you to some of our students here at SUNY New Paltz, PJ Kern and Tracy McGarry, who are part of our LGBTQ student advisory group here at the museum. Um, and I'm then gonna kick it over to the curator and our director, the curator of the exhibition, Life After the Revolution, and our director, Anna Conlin. Hi, thanks, Zach. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for joining us. It's really lovely to see your faces. Um, so a bit of background uh, in preparation for the exhibition, Life After the Revolution, Kate Millett's Art Colony for Women. Uh, a group of us got together in the spring um, and had a, a similar conversation to this, which we then transcribed and is part of the catalog, which will be on the way to you guys soon. So <laughs> that's going to be our mailing one to each of you. Um, and it was such a special conversation and it was so wonderful to, you know, hear from all of you, you know, your experiences of life at the farm and being part of the colony and the community of women who were part of um, the art colony at Millet Farm, that we wanted to do it again and we wanted to share it with wider audiences and have other people participate. So, and I think also having the exhibition up and, and um, having toured a lot of students and a lot of different groups around the show now, like I'm thinking about this history a little bit differently, you know, based on how people have responded, um, you know, all in positive ways and actually, we might get to that, how new generations are, you know, are reacting to this history and thinking about the issues that um, the folks at Millet Farm in the 70s and 80s were, you know, dealing with. And actually one of the most surprising things is that for so many of the young people that I've spoken to about the show is a lot of those issues are still really relevant to their lives today. And that, you know, the connection is encouraging. The fact that less progress has been made is perhaps less encouraging. Um, but that's why one reason that we're really glad that Tracy and PJ can join us today as well, um, because I really encourage them to ask questions and chime in and, and be in conversation. Um, and if anyone as part of this Zoom has questions that come up, um, please put them in the chat. Um, I think, you know, we're pretty informal and so, happy to have you know q a and people jump in you can raise your hand or put it in the chat and we can you know unmute you but i think to begin at least we'll turn it over to uh the community of women who were part of millet farm um i know sophie Keir, kate's uh partner is going to try and join us she's driving down to the city right now so she might hop on a little later um so I think if we go around the room and I'll um, and we'll have everyone who was part of the farm just introduce themselves, who you are, um, when you spent time at the farm, the nature of your your connection to the farm, um, and we'll take it from there. I think it will be quite organic. So if and if you if any of you have anything particularly you want to share, please do. Um, so I will start with. Um, Maybe Joan and Linda, do you want to go first and introduce yourselves? Sure, if somebody has to. <laughs> Linda Clark. Um, I was a good friend of Kate's for many years um, before the farm uh, started. And um, in the early days of the feminist movement and the, the second wave, and we were in the same consciousness raising group and uh, we were neighbors in the Lower East Side. And, um, you know, we became very dear friends. I went away from that uh, atmosphere. I, I joined several um, ashrams uh, because I had another thing on my mind as well as a feminism. Um, and, and that took me 10 years to get that out of my system, so to speak. When I came back, I stayed with uh, Phyllis Berkby, um, this wonderful feminist who also was in our CR group originally. 
And then uh, we invited Kate and Sophie for dinner. It was Valentine's Day, it happened to be, but I had just come back and you know we thought it would be fun to see each other, et cetera. So uh, then they introduced me to the subject of the farm and said that this is, they were going, they're having this project and would I come and be the cook? <laughs> well, I really had nothing else to do, frankly. And um, I was sort of at loose ends. So I said, of course. So that's how I started uh, living there for three months in the summer and a little bit longer, uh, actually sometimes and um renewed my my friendship with kate of course and, and met sophie a uh, remarkable person who could i always first thing i remembered about sophie and i never tire of describing it again is she could just take apart a lawnmower and then put it together all the pieces on the ground and it was very impressive to me um so that's my beginning i first went to the farm in 1988 where I got to meet a lot of people who I'm now seeing on the screen. It's so nice, even Lisa from out there in Washington. Wow. Um, and I had read all of Kate's work and I had read the works of many of the women I ended up meeting at the farm. So to me, it really was magic. It was the first year they were starting, or the second year, I guess, they were starting to sell Christmas trees, but the first year they were selling them actually at the farm. And being local, I got to experience the farm both in the summer and in the winter time for the selling of the trees, which was magnificent. But it was it was like going to a place of dreams because I was surrounded by amazing women who were doing incredible things. All of the things we had wished for for so many years. I had been active since about 1970, 71. So for me to see this in 1988 was an extraordinary moment. That's great, thank you. Um, Janie, do you wanna go next? Hi there. Hi. Um, <clears throat> I first came to the farm in 1984 and I was living in Minneapolis and working at the um, Minnesota Science Museum in their exhibits department. And that's how I supported my work as a painter. Um, I had read many of uh, Kate's books and I had also been to the McDowell Colony in New Hampshire twice in 1974 and again in 1981. And uh, I was going back East to see my family and uh, bought this magazine to read on the plane and I read it cover to cover and I got to the classifieds and there was an ad for the farm. And I had been so um, uh, moved by my experience at the McDowell colony. I thought that an artist colony was an amazing idea to give artists uh, time and space and not too many demands from the outside world to continue your work. And I had always wanted to see if there could be some way to do that in Minnesota. And I didn't really have the means. And here was this writer hero of mine attempting to do that. And I just, just wanted to be all in right away. It just made my heart beat faster to read that ad and think that I could begin to do that project with other people. So I immediately answered that ad and, um, and was asked to come. And I remember driving up to the farm and getting out of the car and Kate just said, Janie, which is how my family calls me. I'm more Jane in my public life. And it was this immediate endearment and we just, hugged each other as if we had known each other for ages. And that was my day, my first unit at the farm. And the rest is history. That's fantastic. Um, and I'll, I should point out that Jane is one of the artists exhibited in the exhibition. There's many beautiful photographs that Jane took during her time at the farm in the catalog and in the exhibition. Um, and to another exhibiting artist, Tamara, do you want to introduce yourself? 
I'm Tamara Wyndham. Uh, when I was at the farm, I was known as Tamara Bauer. I, I didn't get married. I just uh, changed my name for uh, artistic purposes. Uh, and uh, I was at the farm in 1988 and 1989. Uh, 1988 was kind of a, a warm up for me, and but 1989 was fundamental to my development as an artist and was a really important period where I started uh, work that I'm continuing to make today. And, um, and it was a very uh, profound and moving experience to be in this uh, women only space uh, that we felt this freedom uh, without any men around. Uh, and I, I don't hate men, uh, but, but I do feel a kind of relief uh, and, and freedom when no men are around. And uh, it was a lot of joy. It was like paradise. Uh, uh, there, were all, there were some uh, personal problems, but every, every place I've ever been, there's always been personal problems, so it wasn't perfect, but there were moments of perfection, you know, periods of feelings of paradise that, that were just precious. Um, and um, it was there that I started making uh, body prints, which I, I'm known for today. And I, I also did a, a, a performance. I, I was a strong feminist before I came to the farm. Uh, I was thrilled to meet Kate and to meet many of Kate's um, second wave feminist friends who I, whose books I had read and admired. Um, if there's time, I made a little slideshow of photos of the farm. Um, you can let me know whether, when, and whether it's appropriate to show that. I can go very quickly through it. Yeah, that would be great. Maybe let's let's go keep going around the room, but let's try and get that in before the end. We'd love that. Thank you, okay. uh, Christian. Do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for putting all this together. It's, it's a wonderful thing. Um, I really do think these stories aren't known by the current generation and need, or many of them are not known and they, we, we need our history, our history. Um, so I came to the farm in August 1982 and visited um, for several years thereafter. And I think what always struck me was the beauty the beauty of the pond, the beauty of the rooms, the, the grace of daily life, um, Kate's eye and everything that she did, um, the loose trife blooming around the, out of the window, the clear skies, um, and the fact that women were working uh, without any guys to help them, which was tremendously impressive, you know, the, wasn't just that the shirts were off, it was the muscle and the mentality and the, the fix, figure it out and fix it, figure it out and do it. And the sense of celebration at the end of the day, after a hard day's work, you know, the, I mean, I don't drink, but the raising of the glasses to the, to the accomplishments of the day and the speeches and the festivities was, was, all, was all very wonderful. It's like, we can do this. Um, without without external help, so that was wonderful. Thank you. Into that a little more, um, Lisa Sheets. I don't know if you're around. Your video's off, but Lisa is another exhibiting artist in the exhibition, and certainly spent time at the farm. Um, I don't know if she wants to introduce herself, but I will open that invitation up to you or anyone else here who spent time at the farm. Did anyone else here spend time at the farm that want to introduce themselves? So I have LK here with me. Can, can Great. She doesn't yeah. want to be seen. That's fine. <laughs> no, Sunday morning, we've got our coffees. 
Yeah. yeah, I'm having a few health issues right now, so I'm I'm, I'm wasn't even going to say anything. But um, well, hi to everybody. I just basically <laughs> um, the farm chain was the biggest change in my life. When I came, I came from California in '82 as a rock star with lots of gold, <laughs> and uh, I never really ever left. I'm still very close by, and uh, anyway seeing all of you today just makes me smile it makes me cry but anyway um hi all you guys Kristen you were wonderful like you always are and hi Janie you look like you could still build a barn <laughs> and of course Joan and Clarky who I love with all my heart and that's all I have to say so I'm glad you're doing this Anna this is great and uh Good luck. Thanks, LK. Thanks so much for joining us. So now I'm crying a bit. I'm too. listening. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> ah, um, I'm really glad you're here. Thank you. Um, so I wondered actually if PJ and Tracy had had any questions to, to kick us off. What do you guys think? Oh, I've prepared a few of them. Um, I was wondering what like the recruitment process was because I've it was kind of explaining that there's like kind of a long waiting list to get into the farm, so to speak. Um, and I was wondering what that was like. My experience, uh, I was introduced to Kate by my friend Luisa Yatoba from Brazil, and she brought me to Oban uh in 1987 so i met kate and linda um there and so um they met me and and i made a good impression on linda <laughs> and uh um linda might want to tell the story but i remember her saying that uh Kate said to Linda, I don't know about this Tamara, she seems kind of flaky. And Linda said, oh, I think she will be a calming influence in the kitchen. And I was invited to be the second cook, uh, Linda being the primary cook, but I cook when Linda had, um, was working on something else. And uh, so I, I think that, that, that was one thing. Um, after I stopped going to the farm, I helped Kate with um, publicizing the farm. I wrote an article about the farm for Woman News. It was a feminist newspaper in New York City. And I wrote uh, an article describing the farm and, and uh, Kate was so thrilled with it that she ran my article as an advertisement uh, in the same newspaper later. And then, and then a few years after that, I, I um, told Kate about, um, there was a book that was listing all of the artists colonies in America, I think. And, um, Kate got the farm listed in that book. And, and I'm, I'm not absolutely sure, but I, I think that after the farm was publicized in this book that was about artist colonies, um, that more heterosexual women came. I, before that, it was mostly lesbian and some bisexual women, because Woman News had largely lesbian readership and um, then the, the book was uh, on artist colonies was directed more at the art world and not specifically feminist or lesbian. So that was my impression. I might be wrong, but that that, that was something I, I noticed. That's really interesting, that distinction, just from a, a kind of historical point of view, because I know the farm was listed in, you know the various like lesbian directories and and women's land kind of brochures that would be you know available at different 
uh, women's centers. I've seen them in the farm archives and things like that at the Lesbian Her Story archives where, you know, women within the queer community or with it specifically within the women's community could, or women's movement would learn about the farm and get in touch and write letters and swing by. But the shift over to more of an art world and an artist kind of focus, um, that's really interesting. I can't remember the title of the book. Uh, it was like a catalog, yeah, like a resource for artists. And I, I don't know how big of an influence that was, but. Tracy, do you have any? I do actually. Um, one of my questions was if you all have any advice for um, younger lesbians um, and like queer women trying to build a similar sense of community. Um, and that also ties in with another question I had, which would be, do you think something like the farm would be achievable in like 2021 if young, if like this generation of lesbians was to try to start something similar, like would it be as sustainable? Yeah, Clucky. Um, that's a nice question. I appreciate that question. When my dear friend LK was talking, um, I realized that one of the most extraordinary things about the farm and about that time was the sense of sisterhood. And it was such a profound connection between women, between gay women and straight women. At first, it didn't even matter. I mean, it was just there. And it was all these women. And we all had our little, you know, of course, differences. And we all had our little focus of protest. I don't like that. I don't like that. Whatever. But it was a mass of consciousness at a time when nothing like it had ever appeared before in this kind of massive east, west, north, south display. And out of that came consciousness raising groups, which, pro, you know, again, um, emphasize the sisterhood is powerful thing and, and um, not to rant on, but in your generation, you know, it seems I would like to know, do you have that sense of sisterhood or do you feel it? I mean, there's so many things that are different. You're facing a collapsing climate a deteriorating planet, a terrible racist upheaval, a non-functioning government, so many things perhaps that we did not face. But um, what kept us together in our, um, our generation, don't forget we had just gone to the moon. That was another thing. Wow. It was something else. Something else that entered into the picture. Possibility, Johnny says, exactly. And I'm and I my sense is that when you have that kind of thing, it, however it's it, it comes whatever it comes from it a gender issue you know um, um, some other issue it's significant and it's helpful and it brings people together and it doesn't have to be people that actually with the same background and the same identification. Um, Women generally, you know, it's very not, I just have one more thing to say. When you're, my generation knows today has a different perhaps feeling about Afghanistan, for example, and what's happening to women there and the women in Mexico or other places on the continent, the Congo, we have a different energy, a different ferocious response perhaps than younger people today, because we know what it's like uh, in our soul to be trapped and spit upon and abused by half of the human. I mean, we know intuitively because of all the experiences that we had during a, in the seventies and then of course continuing up. In conclusion, sisterhood is everything and it was everything uh, at the time. If I may, I'll jump in since we're unmuted, but my first reaction to your question, Tracy, was yes, yes, yeah, go, do it, have, let it happen. 
try. I mean, do all the same crazy stuff we did and make all the same mistakes probably, but it's worth it. It's, getting that sense of possibility and hope again is, is what we need, I think. And Sophie, I believe, is interested in keeping the farm going in some ways. So hopefully she will jump on here and perhaps you can make a connection with her because obviously things are very, very different now, but the space is there and the history, the history is there and um, it might be easier than you think. Yeah, tomorrow. Uh, I wanted to say that uh, the farm was made possible through Kate's generosity. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I read an account. Uh, she said, Kate said that she bought the farm with the money she made from her book, Sexual Politics. Yeah. And it was women, you know, thousands and thousands of women who bought copies of that book and she wanted to give back to the feminist movement and and so um the farm was kate's way of giving back and um and that was very beautiful and um like to create something new i mean you could have a, a benefactor or, or there are other ways to do it uh, where women can pool their resources or or rent something. I mean, it's or squatting. I mean, there's many different approaches and, and there were other um, women's uh, communes. There was a book called Lesbian Land. Uh, that's probably out of print, but but uh, has probably the Lesbian History Archives has a copy of it, and it's stories about women's farms, lesbian farms all over. So there's many ways to approach it, but and I also wanted to second that I, I know Sophie wants to continue something. I don't know exactly what her plans are. So, um, but and I want to thank Kate for her generosity. Thank you. PJ, do you have any other thoughts or, or questions? Anna, we have um, mm. hand raised. Yeah, I thought Joanne had her hand raised. Great. Unmuting. Uh, you think I'd be easy with the Zoom stuff, but um, one of the things that with the farm was that it, uh, part of Kate's dream was to make it intergenerational also, so that it would, you know, as we all age, there'd be a younger generation coming up. And so it would be that circle of life, you know, a feminist life, you know, so there's always that possibility. One thing at the farm, um, was that we did have women there who were from age 20 to 70. Um, Keats was one of, uh, and Keating was one of the youngest at 20, I, at the time was 35. There was a woman, um, Mary O'Neill, who was 70, and Kate was around 50 at the time. So I think we had a lot of perspective um, about generations. Uh, Mary wasn't up to doing the work in the fields, so she did other things. She um, worked around the farmhouse and planted and, uh, you know, uh, flower boxes and did all kinds of extra work that people working in the fields couldn't do. And um, I guess if I had anything to say to um, her younger participants would be that um, I think it was crucial for us to do it in person. Um, somehow we're all in boxes and the, the physicality of the farm made a deep, deep impression. I think the rigor of the work, um, the shared um, energy of being throughout the entire day of the, you know, all the friction and wonder of living together um, created um, friendships and deep, deep bonds and um, friendships that have lasted three 
decades, four decades. And, and that's um, a way to bring what happens to you into the future. I think Kate, in the film that's in the exhibition, I think Kate talks about, um, you know, rethinking the way we live, living this life we imagined at the farm and, and even just that I think she's, I think the phrase is like the spaces between our bodies, like that being in, you know, in person, in community, in the same spaces as each other, whether it's working or friendship or being lovers or making art, you know, how we are with each other in, in that space was something that um, seems like was important thing at the farm. And I also just wanted to, Jane, your, what you just talked about, the uh, many generations being at the farm. Sophie mentioned to me once, and I can't remember the name of the woman, but of a friend of the farm who would visit, uh, who was older, but had spent time in Europe, you know, in the 30s and 40s, and had actually, um, you know, spent time with Gertrude Stein and Alice B. Tuckwest, and were part of that coterie of Parisian, you know, sapphic lesbian community there, which is, you know, as a queer historian, like another area that is, I'm, you know, fascinated and inspired by. And knowing that there was a direct connection with a woman who was part of that, you know, history and also part of the farm history is just, you know, so inspiring. Tomorrow, was, when was it Buffy going. Johnson you talked yes, it about? Yes, it was, it was. Oh, Buffy the Johnson. Lady of the Beast. Oh, yes. I, I met her at the farm. She was very intense. She, she was, was intense. She was badass. I, <laughs> yes, I gave her a ride back to New York from the farm when uh, I was living in New York and was working, so I wasn't able to be at the uh, farm, but I, I would go up uh, many, many weekends. And uh, I was at the farm one weekend when Buffy Johnson was there and we rode back to um, New York and she was an unbelievable flirt. And she flirted me out of my cool sunglasses, which I just ended up giving to her because she was so charming. <laughs> And she was an incredible painter, uh, just an amazing painter. Her paintings um, of flowers were just extraordinary. She, she, she um, was a powerhouse. And I think she was probably in her late 70s then, because I remember needing to help her into her apartment when we got there. You know, but she was game. That's awesome. That's so fantastic. I, I always have a million questions, but I don't want to dominate. Um, PJ or Tracy, do you have any responses or any further questions? I'm still trying to figure out how to word this question, so you can go ahead. <laughs> okay, I have actually a specific question for um, Joan. As as a local, um, were you? Did you live in Dutchess County? Were you? Were you? You know, I lived over in New Paltz, across the river. Oh, okay. Um, there was a group of women um, who met regularly called Sage Group. It was a group of older lesbians. And Kate once, I knew of the farm, but I had never dared to go over. And Kate once opened it up to the community and invited this group to come. And I was really excited. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. And a woman named Alma Routsung, who's a writer, Isabel Miller was her writing name, who wrote Patience and Sarah, was a friend of mine and her partner, Julie Weber, who's an artist. And I went with them to the farm and it was just life-changing. Like LK said, you know, you go and you're never quite the same. For me, it was personal also because the first person I saw at the farm was Linda, who was sitting on the front steps really angry covered with gasoline because she had poison ivy and thought gasoline would be the cure for it and she had on these boxer shorts that said harvard and she was just sitting there and alma said you know Corky, you know i said no i don't know her i don't know anybody and she said well you must meet her and alma was a big formidable woman she marches me up to linda and says, i 
Linda Clark. This is Joan Casamo. And Linda's <laughs> so, <laughs> so no. all my goes away. And Linda, I didn't know Kate was having company today. I thought this was my day off, and now all these women are coming. <laughs> so that was my introduction to Clarky and, oh, no, and the terrible. farm. And <laughs> terrible but um it was it was wonderful being close by and some years we felt like the little farm annex like we'd have field trips and people would come over to our house <laughs> the women would come over on mass and uh we'd have a little dinner or something at our house as well as um i i spent one full summer at the farm but after that we just went back and forth back and forth and linda remained the cook or mother or whatever her role was at the time, and I kept trying to tug her on my end, and Kate kept trying to keep her at the farm on her end, but she survived, and it was great to be able to go whenever whenever we wanted, and Kate always had a little job for us, because you didn't go to the farm and just visit. You went to the farm and added something of your own, and in the winter, it was particularly fabulous to be able to sell trees and have all the people from the community come and cut down these Christmas trees that we knew what the women had gone through during the summer to make them so beautiful. Yeah, I love that um, I included in the exhibition just some original labels that used to be attached to the Christmas trees. And it says, you know, these have been cultivated by, you know, many years of women artists have helped grow, have, have grown these trees and that, you know, drawing attention to the fact these are really special trees. Yes. It was um, I, wonderful. And I just want to bring your attention. Um, Roberta Gould was also at the farm. Hi, Roberta. Hi, Hi Roberta. Roberta. And um, I think Lisa unmuted, so maybe she'll we could get her back again. Hi. Um, can... Were you calling for me? This is Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Yeah, we'd love to hear from you and Roberta, but Lisa, go ahead. Like, so Lisa's one of the artists in the exhibition. Um, Lisa, do you want to introduce yourself and say when you were on the farm? Yep, here I am. I'm moving around today. That's why I had everything kind of turned off. <laughs> um, I was uh, at the farm in 1994 for three months. And at that time, uh, I found the ad in Art Calendar, which was a resource where you could find out about exhibits and things. And I, I saw it listed there and I was like, hey, that's for me. And so I, you know, just sent the application in. And then, I don't know, a, a reasonable time later, like a month or two, I got this letter from Kate and I was so excited. And um, I uh, started reading all the books. Like I had some familiarity with her writing, but I had never actually read one of her books. So I read all of her books before I went there. and. Um, one one sort of funny thing is that uh, I actually spent my first wedding anniversary at the farm. And so several of us at the farm went out to this Chinese restaurant to celebrate my anniversary. <laughs> and we, we were really ridiculous. We were really having a good time. But uh, and my husband sent this huge bouquet of flowers to the farm. And I remember when the tr little truck came in delivering flowers and they they got out of the car and they started looking at all the buildings and they were like holding these flowers and women's heads were pointing out of like windows all over the place going, who's it for, who's it for, you know? And like trying to figure out who get the flowers today, you know? Um, but uh, it, it was really a great, really a great, I, I haven't been back there to visit many times because I live so far away, but uh, I made a lot of great early collage work there. At that time I was a sculptor but I didn't uh, work on sculpture there because just difficult to haul all that material there, but um, super empowering about how I was working on like building a deck and, you know, driving the little mower and like just learning how to do a lot of phys physical functional things that I had not known how to do before and met lots of wonderful people there. At that time, it seemed like a lot of people came only for half a summer. So there were a lot of people who came for like a month and a month or a month and a half and then left. And then a new group came the second half. But there were like a few of us that stayed for the whole three months. That's great. Roberta, do you, do you want to introduce yourself? 
need to unmute you. There you go. Can you see me? Yes, oh. we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, I I went there uh, because I was in between uh, leaving a place and going to Mexico, and uh, Linda suggested I go to the farm. And uh, she was very gracious, uh, Kate, and uh, and I was there for two or three weeks. You know, I was cutting trees, and uh, and I got to know Kate, and I saw Kate. In fact, uh, afterwards, sometimes I would drop by because I am uh, live near there. In fact, I saw her maybe I don't know a year and a half before she left us. I remember she wanted Chinese food. She got a what do you call it, chofan, the noodles, so, you know, I got it somewhere far. And um, <clears throat> she was very supportive of, um, I was a writer, I am a writer, and uh, <clears throat> I remember I had a little reading there, maybe before I was there or after, and she was very generous. She gave a tremendous commendation for me, which I put on the back of my books and uh, very proud of. Um, <clears throat> I was at her exhibit just recently, the other day, and I mean, I think this exhibit is online and you see a lot of her work. I was a lot of her work, including the fantastic furniture and some uh, and the paintings and uh, some and videos in which uh, uh, the, the members of the, you know, the community and people who've gone to the community are talking. And I think you probably can see those online too. And, and they're really talking about the, the devotion and the dedication of this woman. I mean, you know, there were a lot of communes all around. And in answer to that question, I mean, you find out how they made a commune, but there has to be uh, an impulse behind it and, and someone who, who, who give everything, you know, to, to make it really the main part of their life, which, which she did. And it was really a great place. Um, um, I, in fact, uh, and there was one person there, I was trying to think of her name, Natalie Juni. She was one of the youngest. And she was a painter and she was a little bit on the periphery as I was because I, I just came in for a couple of weeks and uh, every now and then she sends me information about her, her exhibits or her paintings. And that woman has grown so much. I, I wish I could see her, but uh, somewhere or other, I get these, these, these images and um, you know, it was it was a great place for visual artists, for painters, you know, most of whom were the painters and uh, so on. So that, that's all I have to say. I mean, uh, it was a great experience and um, uh, a short experience and uh, and uh, I got to know Kate and thank you for introducing me, Linda, suggesting I go there, which I didn't even know it was there when you told me about it, okay? Thank Bye. you. That's great. I have a question. Um, partially because of spending so much time in the exhibition and seeing these images of Kate. Um, and I'm particularly drawn to these images where it's kind of like clearly like she's there, you're, you're partying, you know, and, and cause she just looks like the life of the party. I mean, and I'm really, I'm curious, like, what was she like to party with? And also, was that like same personality like when you were working with her? Does you know was there like this sort of division in in her between work and fun? And if yeah, that's kind of I'm curious about that. I would say that Kate had gusto in everything she did, whether she was working or whether she was painting or whether she was um, sitting at a dinner table and, and telling stories. And that if she wasn't, if she didn't have gusto, that meant that something was going on that was not so great, you know, she was in a bad place. But it, she, she had the gift of living her life with, with great joie de vivre, with great daily pleasure. And that was one of her, one of the things I think she communicated to all of us. Um, one thing I'd like to say about, um, I think I never laughed so much as when I lived at the farm. We, uh, we, we laughed over everything. And um, also I remember, I just thought of this, I hadn't thought of this in quite some time, was that we used to have 
um, Friday night parties. Their work was so exhausting. And at the end of a week, you really felt it. And even though you were exhausted, you found this unbelievable energy to just dance into the night. And we used to have great parties after dinner. Friday night parties were part of the summer. And Kate was really good at it. <laughs> Kate liked to have theme parties sometimes where we would dress and costume. I, I, I think she did more than once where everybody was supposed to speak French, which- Oh, that was the Bastille Day. Yeah, oh, that, that completely intimidated me because I <laughs> never studied French. So I, wow. I spoke Spanish instead. <laughs> I, I was so intimidated by the French that I came as Marcel Marceau and didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> I came as the little prince. <laughs> It was a, great fun. <laughs> we had one night we had to all come to the dinner table as our mothers. I remember that distinctly. Now okay we, looks like Rosie. <laughs> now I am my mother, but but we all had to keep that persona through through dinner, through the whole thing. We were our mothers. That was an experience. But Kate was always up for a party, except when she wasn't. <laughs> That's a wonderful party theme coming dressed as your mother. You you wanted to contrast it with uh party versus work. We all worked very hard and there was a very strong work ethic. And Kate did not push this on us. It it seemed organic or natural and every once in a while somebody would show up to the farm who didn't want to work they just wanted to hang out and oh that person was shunned if there was a woman that just wanted to hang out where we were the rest of us and it wasn't kate telling us this it, it was just the way we felt and i i remember the very first time i came to the farm Louisa brought me for Oban and I'd never been there before. I walked into the kitchen and looked around and some woman, I don't know who she was, she looked at me and she said, why aren't you working? Uh, and I was like, well, what do you want me to do? And, and then she started ordering me like to help with the vegetables. <laughs> it, was just, it was very intense that way. <laughs> It was kind of wonderful. I was wondering if actually some of you could, collectively could could describe Oban and tell us what it was and what that experience was like. Because I imagine many of you went to many, many Oban festivals. Yeah. Um, well, it was a wonderful occasion. You know, it was a very special. I'm sorry, we have some construction we, going on out right outside our window. I'm sorry. Um, but people that had been to the farm from the very beginning, many, many would come back, 30, 40. LK mm -hmm. would always make a couple of turkeys. That was a tradition uh, with all the trimmings. And, and we would meet in a large room at the spa, mostly at the barn, I think. Anyway, a very large room that accommodated. It was, it was a reunion, but it was a very touching reunion. Of course, there were many toasts and uh, a lot of wine, alcohol. Uh, another thing is Kate did party. Uh, she had a wonderful sense of partying. She, she could drink anyone under the table a thousand times. And, and uh, many people fell under the table to try to keep it <laughs> <laughs> I realized immediately I could never keep up and I never drank it. a drop. <laughs> but, uh, well, the dishes would never get done. But <laughs> the, the uh, <laughs> the Oban was a wonderful and sentimental and uh, and actually a, a profound experience that Janie Winter had a lot to do with it. She would make the raft. And you could tell that. It was about very ceremonial in that way, Clarky. Like um, it, it, it culminated in um, everyone uh, bringing homemade little lantern rafts down to the pond. And the thing that I would build was a kind of central 
larger raft that would be almost like a bonfire on the water. And everyone would light these little candle rafts. Um, and on the big raft, they would put the name of a person alive or dead, a wish for something, um, thoughts, prayers, however you wanted to somehow communicate um, uh, to the universe, I guess. But it was an end of summer, right? And uh, a kind of all souls night in a way. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it was very moving. And we took it seriously as if it was uh, like a religious festival in that we believed in it, at least for the night, um, that our our hopes would go somewhere, that, that these little lanterns on the pond would mean something to us, would represent a person or a lost one or a, a desire for something better. Um, and I remember Julie Weber composed some music that we, um, that was very beautiful and ethereal that was played while this very quiet ceremony. We just came down to the pond and put the boats on the water and one by one, and they just floated on the pond all night long. Mm -hmm. It's very beautiful, very moving. And then Joni would sing her song she wrote for the pond or for the farm. Farm, which farm is song. Beautiful, the farm song. Oh, I hope she gets to sing it to us now. <laughs> we miss <laughs> it. <laughs> anyway. And and there was a, there's a beautiful uh, film at the exhibit of of the Oban ceremony. Uh, lasts about ten minutes. I don't know if that's on the video that you can access. Hmm. At the museum. Yeah. Um, Joan, are you willing to sing the song? No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> No, not, not today, but thank you. <laughs> I hope the lyrics are transcribed somewhere so it can live on. Okay. I think the thing that Kate liked best about me was my turkeys. She had my turkey right up until the last Christmas. I mean, everything was going, she'd call and she'd say, will you make a turkey? And anyway, I'll never... And the last Christmas, our turkey got stuck on the George Washington Bridge in traffic. Oh, yeah, we brought one in and we were <laughs> supposed to have dinner at such and such a time and we got stuck in traffic on Christmas Eve. Oh. And we, had the tur we had all the food and everybody was at the loft chomping on. On the bed, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Christian, would you want to say anything about Oban? Me? Yeah. Well, one of the Obans happened um, a few days after I'd gotten the news that my brother had killed himself. And so when we went down to put the little rafts on the water, I put a raft for myself, a little with a lighted candle, and then also a raft for my brother James. And it was, it was very powerful watching the little lights flicker away across the water. Uh -huh. And Kate and I sat, stood pretty close to each other because she, she, she had experienced Sita's suicide and had understood very much what I was going through. And the end of that story was coming down the next morning and finding that of all the rafts fl flung across the water in the course of the night, my brother's raft and mine had ended up together in the reeds, which was somehow very right. Wow. Thanks for sharing that, Kristen. Mm -hmm. Many of you mentioned how you read Kate's books, uh, you know, quite a few of them before you came to the farm. And um, I really didn't read many of Kate's books until years later. I, I didn't have time for some reason. And um, Lately, I came across something that I felt and I feel is the most extraordinary thing Kate ever wrote. And it happens to be part of a little chapter in the politics of cruelty. 
Mm -hmm. And it's a chapter, it's been titled Sri Aurobindo. The reason I was looking it up because uh, he's a spiritual fellow and I was interested in him at the time. And I actually had mentioned to Kate, you might want to use him in your chapter on imprisonment because she was talking about those individuals who had been in prison for a very long time. Yeah. Uh, she had been particularly uh, influenced by uh, Angela Davis, who had been in prison months before getting out. And it's a little part of a chapter. And it's about a Chinese woman, Nina Cheng, C-H-E-N-G. And she was put in jail, wrongly. She was um, worked for a Western company, I think Shell Oil. It's a time of tremendous transition in China. And she was one of the unlucky ones. Well, she stayed there for years. She never admitted any wrongdoing. And she suffered enormously in great dignity as they tried day after day after day to make her admit something that she didn't, that she had not done. This is part of what an autocratic society that it imprisons you and then you forces you to say yes I did this and then they can say okay well now you know better you can leave but she would never do that and Kate just wrote a few pages about this extraordinary person and I must say and I've never in my life read anything more powerful and impressive and she just got it you know from a few books that told about Nina Chang one of them hers uh, this woman who later came to America and stayed here and, and wrote this book. And I was just going to say, if you've never read it, it's something so extraordinary. And it's about a woman so, so much what I wanted to be when I read it. Wow, I wish I, I hope I can ever be that someday. Well, maybe. Nina Chang and Politics of Cruelty, Chapter Sri Aurobindo. Uh, Linda, can you read that now? Linda? Well, it would take a bit of time and it would take away from other people's, uh, you know. Mm. You start it. One thing, hearing you speak about that, Linda, is that strikes me about, you know, I never met Kate. Um, but learning about her through all of you and through the research and through, you know, spending time on this project that always strikes me is that she was, um, she was, I mean, incredibly brave and seemingly fearless about facing really difficult things, really painful things, brutal things, you know, out in the world, her sense of moral justice that, you know, compelled her to engage with, uh, stories of you know deep cruelty or unfairness or you know her work with human rights or torture or you know and much of her art practice you know and her writing and her political activism engages with some of the the, the harshest and darkest and saddest cruelest parts of humanity and who we are collectively in our history um, and what a contrast that seems with her far, the farm project with Mill, Millet Farm and the artwork that she made about Millet Farm and 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 her commitment to beauty and her commitment to uh, relief and sustenance and teaching and growth and 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 joy and fun, you know. And I, you know, obviously, I don't think it is a contrast in terms of a binary. It's all part of who she was, um, but it's really that kind of willingness to go there and to 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 embrace all parts of you know our collective human experience and our how we how we show up in the world. Um, and one thing that strikes me about the farm and what I'm learning, continually learning about it, is that there was space for you know the painful stuff and the difficult stuff, as well as the joyful, fun things as well. And I think that is a big gift of Kate's, you know, to, to, to embrace the, the, the kind of the difficult things as well as the joyful things. Yeah. She had great irony. And the just three things I remember, you just, you know, just, uh, 
one word thing. She had tremendous irony and she had a wonderful way of reading the headlines, for example, of the New York Times and and describing, you know, the rascals that were always in the headline, the corruption. She had a wonderful way of identifying corruption and making fun of it enormously and ironically, and uh, and then, you know, eating her breakfast. I, and I also found the other thing I found so extraordinary, though, okay, and I always did, even when um, she was having a difficulty with her uh, bipolar thing, she had a wonderful moral sense. And I don't think she ever lost it, even in, yeah. you know, she she never lost that. Yeah, yeah. And, and that, I think, is the basic thing about this woman. She had a tremendous moral sense. Uh, it wasn't quite developed into being a saint like Dorothy Day, another Catholic, but uh, there it was. And I think the farm is a shining example of this moral sense. Inclusivity, um, hard work gets you a lot of, you know, it's, it's, it's a very traditional thing. And I, I just loved it. And uh, I think that's what really drew me to Kate in the first place. And it, And I felt that in one way or another, I could always remind her of it if she ever forgot. Wow, very good. Kate never gossiped. She was my friend for 40 years. You, she never said her, she didn't gossip. Yeah. You know, like people do. She just put it all in her books. That's exactly right. My friend Penny came up and she was reading Flying and she wanted to know who all the characters were, Clarky. <laughs> Sorry. When Janie came up, my friend Janie came up and uh, she wanted to know who all the characters were in Flying. And I said, well, you were one of them. And you said, oh, no, I wasn't. <laughs> we knew better than yeah we uh, we we knew Bucky. <laughs> oh, you just you I just added I added you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'd like to just say something about what Clarky just said about Kate having a deep moral sense, and also I think. Even though I, I, when you were talking about her being ironic, ironic about reading the paper, I can hear her voice that I sort of with a cigarette in her hand talking about the <laughs> headlines. It just came through to me. But the other thing is that she felt the cruelty of the world very deeply. It, it unnerved her. And, bothered her and enraged her and propelled her. And I think one of the things that the farm did for her was provide the answer to that was its extraordinary beauty and um, the power of nature to kind of have a, um, a kind of eternal voice that would speak to what we do as humans. It was in the face of it, you know, that, that statement about um, life after the revolution, you know, just having a place where there was an idea about work and fairness and inclusion and um, enjoyment and bread and roses that went with the struggle of trying to change the world to be more fair. And I think, you know, just you see it in her silk screens that you know, she captured little moments at the farm of just fun and pleasure and uh, quiet moments. She was, um, I love that about Kate. I, I loved how um, that escape that she found in the farm and the work too, um, let her go on when she felt um, the world so deeply and profoundly. Um, it just let her go on in a strange way. I think, it, I think it fortified her as much as it, you know, it had so many problems and um, difficulties every single day. We still managed to kind of 
lived that life after the revolution at, by the end of the day with a few glasses of wine and us and a good chicken dinner. <laughs> yeah. When I, um, you know, I spent 10 years in a spiritual community of one, actually several, after being a radical feminist and leaving my consciousness raising group and hate. And I, I had this, uh, I had to do this. So, so interestingly, you know, I came away with something, uh, of course, I did. But all the time I was in this various, in these various groups, I remembered Kate's words in my head almost every day, identifying this is corruption, Linda. This is a corruption. This is over here, a corruption. Watch out for that. Not necessarily the same words, but I had been so influenced by our little breakfast at this little table in my apartment when we were reading the newspaper and I, you know, talking about other things and how she taught me how to dissect corruption and moral decay and aberration when I might not have even recognized it. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. it's very subtle. And I must say, in all the 10 years that I was trying to find whatever it was I was trying to find, every day, this voice came in my ear, at least once a day, this is, watch out for that. Don't believe a word they say, you know, watch out for that. And I'm grateful. I'm very grateful. Kate was a, loved words, words and language and, the meanings of words. And one thing that she taught me was about the word radical because it was used all the time. And she said, think about it, look it up, look it up in the dictionary. It means going to the roots. It means going to the roots of things. So I think from what Anna said before, Kate always went to the root of everything and it was dark and it was cold and it was scary and she paid the price for that she went into very very dark spaces that most of us don't want to look at at all and and she did what Janie was saying she felt it she felt these places and she tried to make other people aware she tried to raise other people's awareness about these situations but it took a toll they, they were powerful, powerful um, vibrations or whatever you want to say. I'm one of the woo-woo types. Um, but there were very powerful energies that entered into her from these dark, dark, radical spaces. Uh, PJ, I saw your hand raised. Did... Yeah, I have sort of a question. Um, I've been fortunate to go to like an artist camp and I remember at the end of it, it was very, very difficult to say goodbye to everybody. There was this phenomenon that we called the vortex of tears. And um, it was basically, cause there was like a final play at the end. And after all the actors came out from backstage, this just absolute wave of like sorrow and sadness just washed over everybody. And I was wondering what it was like to come from this like farmland like place of respite and going back to the heteronormative world and like how you kind of processed going back to everything that you were sorry i'm kind of crying <laughs> coming back to um the place where you under the thumb of so many oppressors yeah i i certainly felt that too at the farm and you know from other retreats I've gone on um, and um, it, my my second year there um, 1989 I was able to stay in close touch with um, many people many women I, I knew at the farm and that helped a lot uh, the first year the women I knew didn't live in New York City, uh, where I live, so it was harder to stay in close touch and, and um, 
so that helped a lot uh, my second year. And, and then also it helped that even though I wasn't staying the summer at the farm, like to go back for Obama, to go back and help sell Christmas trees. Uh, we didn't have the internet back then. Uh, there was a, a landline telephone and a, a mail. <laughs> Uh, and that, that was how we stayed in touch. Um, and, and then, but, but yeah, it's, it, it was very um, poignant um, at, the end of the, at the end of the summer. One, one thing that I'd like to state about um, that grief you felt leaving is that um, don't forget that you also have the experience within you and that didn't leave that's still with you. And um, I can't tell you how many times in my life the um, experience of the farm's rigor came up, which helped me deal with real life. I mean, um, there's something about the how hard we worked and how dedicated we were to a something, a big ideal. Um, it let me get through cancer three times. It, um, my wife died of Alzheimer's two years ago. I took care of my mother from 91 to 101. We, um, all those farm girl, in quotes, um, things, that I internalized the strength of that place, Kate's moral fortitude um, that I ate up and never digested fully and I'm still digesting. Um, all those things are with me. I, the only thing that I would say to you is um, do it again. You know, go back to that art camp or recreate that art camp. I mean, you know, I, because my life got so difficult in these last decade, um, I haven't been able to go back to the farm, but I've kept in touch with my farm people. And, they, and it's been very sustaining for me. Um, I found that I went to um, live in Provincetown um, because I wanted to have a place where I could be a gay citizen and not an outlaw and be able to walk down the street with my arm around my wife and not feel like someone's going to kill me. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, trying to find the place and the space to live as if you're living in a world that you can believe in and that doesn't discriminate you against you. If you can find that in pockets in your life, try to be in them as much as you can because they sustain you, you know? So I'm, I'm glad you felt that grief because it meant it was so meaningful, you know? It's something that you got to take away and know that you missed it, you know? So I would say try to do it some more. No. I'm so thankful to Anna that this show is here because I tell everybody, for me, it's so special to walk into work and be in a gay space, right? To feel like that, let, it's like I can see my story uh, on the walls of the museum because it, while I, I clearly was never at the farm, I it it's like, I feel the story. I feel like it's, anyways. So those spaces, that space is kind of here right now for me. And I'm so thankful to Anna for bringing it here. For me, when PJ, when you were saying your feelings, um, it was very schizophrenic for me. I taught in a very conservative elementary school and it was years and years after I had gone to the farm before there was any sense of freedom or dignity or um, or honesty in my life. I mean, it was very schizophrenic. And what Janie says is so very true because 
if you could carry that part of you inside, like I think what the farm did for me was erase my own homophobia and my own self-hatred and my own questionings that I hadn't been able to shed in other ways because it was a very, very different time. I mean, when you look at life now, it's just so, so very different. And it's hard to even imagine, like, she must have been weird if she was doing that, you know, but it wasn't weird. It was more the, it was more the reality. Barbara Love, um, I wish she was here, um, just wrote a book and uh, Memories of a, of a Lesbian Feminist. And she really talks about what it was like in the bad old days. And I highly, highly recommend her book. It's very easy to read. It's just a series of stories. They're not sequential. They're just pieces of her life. And um, it really gives you a picture of how schizophrenic life could be in those days. I, I think what we did a lot um, was we compartmentalized but then we went back to the well of where we felt whole and pulled from that. Yeah. Would it be okay if I show my picture? <laughs> I was gonna ask, yeah. 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 I, thought, I actually thought that everybody was gonna show pictures, but uh, I'll, I'll be quick. Let's see. Where's that concert? Please. Okay. Um, let me just. Uh, okay. So Louisa on the right was the woman that introduced me to Kate. She had been Kate's translator in Brazil, and the the other woman is Louisa's close friend, whose name I don't remember, who came for Oban. Louisa came in August of 88 for like two weeks. And there's Kate and Clarkie, mm. this lovely picture. I wish uh, the photo quality back uh, is, you know, all these grainy photos. I'm sorry. Oh, it looks I'm so used to that one. digital. Here's, here we're trimming trees uh, in the field. And there's a great picture of Sophie. And there's Clarkie laughing. I, that was delightful. I don't know. A great picture, great picture. The name of the woman on the left, but the woman on the right is Liz. And Jean was a painter, and Liz was a writer. They were like best friends. Um, I want to say you should always write on your photos somewhere people's names. Yeah. Remember? Good idea. Of the woman in the striped <laughs> shirt, that's Mary Heather uh, on the right, and in the back is Stephanie and Meryl and Jean. And there's Michelle Coles, who I adore, and Stephanie and Jean. And that's me dressed up in Frida Kahlo style, sort of, with Jean making the peace sign. And um, I think this is Oban. I think the woman with the blonde hair and black, I think she was Kate's niece, who um, Kate just, the, they had a really close relationship. Um, I remember when she came to visit and I, I hardly know who most of these women are because they didn't write the names down. That's me with the guitar. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's hard to tell. All small. Cool. Okay. Um, so anyway, I started wow. making body prints uh, in 1989 at the farm. And um, this one I made at the farm, oh, cool. it's made with my menstrual blood. I was working with menstrual blood. Oh, okay. And then the back, it, it languished for decades and I finished it with the background rather recently. And then this was in the show, this was a performance I did when I was menstruating and I was drawing 
and explaining a dream I had. And then I took my clothes off and came back in and uh, made this rather odd mixture. I broke an egg that had menstrual blood in it and mixed it with uh, hibiscus tea and drank it, which was really intense. And that was my performance that I could not have done anywhere else. Um, let's see, how do I stop share? Uh, I mean, the farm, uh, hell, I couldn't, uh, uh, the farm, all, every, all the art I made was very much about being at the farm. I had other women to help me make the body prints, uh, uh, to do a performance that was on the day I was menstruating would have been really hard to do anywhere else. Um, uh, even just practically, because I, my periods were fairly regular, but I didn't know the exact day, like in New York City, like to call everybody up and say, hey, I'm menstruating today, come over right now. <laughs> that, that wouldn't have worked, uh, but, it, but at the farm, I had an audience right there for, you know, Every, so it was pretty great. And I just, I just uh, very thankful I had this experience. And thank you for looking at my pictures. I, I, I just found these pictures like three days ago, mm. buried in a box. Um, and I, I will send Sophie scans of, of all of them. I, I think she has an archive. Yeah. Um, yeah, you should. Thanks for sharing those tomorrow. They were great. I I would just like I would like to say that that on the VFA, which is Veteran Feminist of America, there on their website, um, on my page <laughs> is the interview that I did with Kate, which Kate says is the best interview she ever did in her life. And it really, if you really, I've never seen anything that shows Kate. It's the Kate that I loved and, and the Kate, yeah. Anyway, it's, you, can, you can see it on there. You can click on it, it's, it's from there. Kristen, you were there that day we did it. Okay, what is the website link so that people can know? Can you put it in the chat? Yeah, hang on, hang on, I will do it. I think it's vfa.org. Okay. But well, hang on. It's Veteran Feminist of America. And they put a link on that, on, on my page. Mm -hmm. it. I think they told me, I've never looked at it, but they told mm -hmm. me it's there. Mm -hmm. Sounds and good. It's a wonderful interview. And if you look, you, you should see it. It's all Kate. It's not, it's not really even an interview. It's just Kate talking for babyfa.org. Really, really nice. Mm -hmm. I'll go there. Hmm. Okay. Well, how many people received notice of this uh, reunion or did everyone who was ever there or uh... DJ. pardon mm -hmm. what we did she yeah uh, Sophie sent it to us yesterday but I know that when I was there with my students uh, Anna mentioned and so did Zach so many, many people got an email apropos. It was on the Facebook page too. The, there's a Facebook page for women who have been to the farm. I see. Okay. Yeah. I received this from you and I knew, I knew about the, uh, the event at the, at the library. I didn't realize it was a, um, online event at 11 o'clock today. I would have gone to the library. I'm uh, not to the library, the museum. Okay, good. Well, I'm glad you could join us. I'm glad you were part of the Good to be here. Yeah. Does anyone have any further questions, Tracy or PJ or anyone else or, or anything that anyone wants to share? I just want to um, emphasize that a major reason that Kate started the farm for artists was to uh, give women the background and the fortitude to go out into the world without fear 
of what they would find, particularly in, in regards of their acceptance of their art or and any kind, you know, uh, at that time, perhaps it's not different, perhaps, who knows right now, but um, there's a tremendously threatening vibration toward women everywhere, in, oh. every, in every profession. Yeah. And it was, it was, you know, sickening, basically, but, but it was hardly even noticed because it was so ordinary and Kate couldn't stand it. And she, she couldn't stand the fact that young women, particularly, and she found, and she realized this when she was at Columbia teaching, that would go out into the world and be so insulted and uh, neglected and et cetera. So that was one of the reasons that she, she wanted this place. So she herself could imbibe, could instill into her young students um, a sense of courage and fortitude and independence. So you can go out in the world and do what you wanted to do and uh, and not be overcome. She herself often was terribly afraid when she went to Iran. She was very afraid. Uh, but she, but she, it was easier for her in a sense because she had all kinds of people around her who looked upon her as a support. And, you know, when you're, when you're a support and people are looking for you not to be afraid, then you become not afraid. And, and so that helped her through her life. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I um want to say thank you so much to all of you. That um I did not expect to be crying multiple times. <laughs> Uh, I thought maybe a lot of laughter, but the tears were refreshing for me. Um, so thank you so much for for your for being candid and 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 for sharing your experience with, with us. It is um, really great. I don't, <laughs> words kind of mm. you know I don't have words for it. I'm feeling a lot of things right now, and I'm very very thankful to all of you for that. Tracy, do you want to? Yes, sorry. I also would just like to thank all of you so much for um, participating in this conversation. It was so nice and inspiring and just a really, really great thing to hear um, stories of the sisterhood, like you said, that um, you guys shared at the farm and just a sense of like queer community. And it's is some, I would like to, um, like a few of you mentioned, get in contact with Sophie, I think you guys said, um, to see what I could do to participate maybe. So I just want to thank all of you so much for that opportunity. Wonderful. Thank you, Tracy, and thank you, PJ, too, both of you for being part of today. It's really meaningful to have you both involved. Um, very well, much for showing up today and giving kind words and advice. Oh. Right, and it was really great to hear all of you speak and to hear about your experiences at the farm and to remember Kate and the short time that I was there and, and what she stood for and what she stands for. Yeah. And I'd like to just thank you for all your efforts putting this show together. It's been wonderful getting a chance to know you during the process. And I think Kate would have just loved this exhibit. It just really uh, recreated so many things about, about the farm. And um, it gave me a perspective. I, I, um, I found myself thinking of myself as like one of the characters in the movie, A League of Our Own, about the women's baseball team. I, I, I just was living the farm. I didn't think of myself as being part of history. And it was the first time I ever thought that. I just thought I was friends with these people. <laughs> and, and, um, 
And uh, it made me feel like I was part of something that I'm glad I was part of because it was a tiny piece of women's history, but it was a very meaningful one for me. And um, I'm happy to be history. It's now time for this next generation to have their own wonderful history. Thank you, Jane. And, and I, you know, none, none of this project, you know, it's just, I'm just facilitating these different connections and, you know, trying to amplify different voices and, and none of it could have happened without you and everyone else and Sophie in particular. Um, and I just feel super honored to have played a part in that. Um, and that, you know, the, the personal is political, but like these personal experiences that you each had um, that these, you know, that that was part of your lives. I mean, you can see today just a glimpse of the powerful resonance that has for other people today. I mean, Zach and I have shown, you know, so many students and um, visitors around that exhibit now, and the, you know, the virtual one, virtual 3D tour will live online in perpetuity, and we have the catalog now as well, and you know, what was meaningful for you all still has meaningful, you know, -ness and has ripple effect outwards and is powerful and needed today as well. So just thank you so much for sharing your experiences with, with us because it, it's, it makes a difference, it matters. I also want to say the catalog is wonderful. We bought it a couple of weeks ago because being in Florida, we couldn't get to the show. So as soon as we saw the catalog was available and uh, it is marvelous. We were very impressed with it. Yeah, so everybody's it. in for a treat. It is wonderful. Very, very elegant. Yes, the beautiful catalog. Thank you. Thanks for all of you being involved in it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks, Tamara. Thank you, guys. Thanks to see everybody. Thank you, bye-bye. Have a wonderful Sunday. Bye. Bye. Oh. You just can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. 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 bye.